Good morning again, and I hope you're all doing well. And welcome to my video on Fugal writing. So I'm going to make two different versions of this video. One is going to be with myself demonstrating the Fugal methods here at the keyboard. And in the other video that I'm going to make, it's going to just be the scores presented so that you can see how I, well, the, the process of fugal writing while well, with playing it versus just looking at it with the score. So, like I said, there are going to be two different versions of this video. And I'm going to look at two fugues, and one of them is my F minor fugue from my keyboard suite and the other is the C-sharp minor fugue. So, I'm not really qualified to teach fugal writing, say, like a, how you'd see it in a textbook. So, this isn't going to be saying how you should write a fugue, but it's simply sharing my own methods. And that's, that's really all there is to it. So fugues will always start off with a subject. In this case, the subject is just four notes. And from those four notes, the problem is that you can't grasp if we're in F major. It's not until we hear the entrance in C minor that we are in F minor instead of, say, F major. Now, with a three-voice fugue, you have to introduce the subject in the tonic in whichever range you're really looking for. In this case, we're starting in the soprano in the alto and we answer in the tenor, and the answer is always either a fifth above or a fourth below. So here we're in F minor, a fifth above or a fourth below would be the tonality of C minor. So let's just hear the subject and then the, and then the answer. It's just four notes. So after we hear the answer in C minor, the third answer would be back in the tonality, in your home key of F minor. And depending on the motion of subject, answer, subject, you would have to continue either upwards or downwards. In this case, we hear the subject in the F above, middle C, then we have the subject with middle C. So, properly, theoretically, you would have to have the subject answer in the voice below the answer. So let's just hear it until we reach the answer in F minor. in fugal writing that you can do is add different elements of the counter subject or any kind of thematic material much later on in the fugue. In this case, this is a very chromatic fugue, and chromatic steps are the half steps on the piano. So F to E natural is chromatic, E natural to E flat is chromatic, so on and so forth. The concept of descending chromaticism, particularly in the Baroque era, is the concept of kind of grief or really mourning. So that works out very well in this case overall. So after the third answer in your tonic key, in this case F minor, 
you would have a sequence. And we'll get to sequences in a bit. Let's just hear from the third answer in F minor. hear it in the bass after we have the subject again, that descending chromaticism. And then finally we fall to F. Now, the purpose of the sequence is to not only modulate to a different key, in this case we're modulating to the relative major, which would be A flat major because A flat major shares the same key signature as F minor, four flats, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. So this sequence in particular, it still consists of three voices. And let's just hear how we tie everything together. So we're going to hear from measure 6 all the way to 11, 12, 13, 14. And just, uh, you, sorry, you'll hear how the sequence ties everything, everything together. in the bass is stepwise. And we'll hear this sequence much sorry, we'll hear this sequence much later in the fugue, but we'll get to that later. So in a fugal writing, essentially the rule is well it's not rule, but in the case of Bach, it's really copy and paste. You have the subject, and you can hear it in all different, uh, different keys. So in this case, we have the subject in F minor, C minor, A flat, and that's really it. Certainly other composers have been able to develop fugal writing to the extent that you can have keys far beyond, not necessarily far beyond, but a little bit out of the realm of those keys. I think in one of my other discussion videos I referenced a couple Bach fugues where we hear six in the key of E minor. I think it's the wedge fugue that does that. Anyways. So now at bar 11, 12, 15, 14, at bar, bar 14, we have the subject in A flat major, and it's introduced in the bass. And then we hear it a measure later in the soprano, in the alto. Is that the alto or is that the tenor? I can't really tell. Let's see if we can hear it again. don't necessarily have to modulate to E flat, but I decided to do that because in the key of A flat, you have the fifth of that is E flat. You can introduce a flat seven in that, which would be D flat, and it gives it this sort of muddy sound because this D flat can descend to C perfectly. But you can also 
make a deceptive cadence out of it, where instead of falling to A flat, the E flat can descend down to A, D flat can descend down to C, and one of the other E flats can even rise up to F. So instead of this kind of quality, we'd have this quality. It doesn't really fit. So let's just hear from bar 1, 9, 12, 13, 14 to bar 16, 17, 18, 19, the beginning of 19. So listen for the subject again. again in the bass in bar 17 and immediately we fall back to the realm of E flat 7 let's just hear that one more time this tritone here it's it's a B flat 7 chord because we're going to E flat major. And then instead of E, would that be E natural flat? E flat natural? E flat normal? Uh, it's just. E flat seven now in bar seven, seven, eighteen. Now after those introductions in A flat, A flat, E flat, uh, we can now begin the conclusion of the fugue. So fugues, you have the the opening section, if you will, which has all the answers and sorry, subject, answer, subject. And then you have your episodic material, which is where you can modulate to different keys if you want, and then really have different sections which call back to the first section. So in this case, this fugue has your initial execution of the subject, answer, subject. And then you have these, you have really two sections of episodes and then the conclusion. So this sequence, you'll recognize that the bass descends in downward motion. And let's just hear that alone. Now this calls back to the sequence in bar 10. Descend. Oops. Instead of ascending to A flat, we descend to C, which is the five of F minor. So let's just hear the sequence as it is. in bar 24 and in bar 25 we have what they call a pedal tone and pedal tones are where I'm going to move this closer just in case you can't hear me I should have thought about that earlier so pedal tones 
are instances where you have a suspended note tied over the course of many bars to further emphasize that that pedal tone is either the tonic or the dominant. Now in this case it's I guess unusual to have a fifth of the fifth be the pedal tone. So in the case of fifth of the fifth, F minor, fifth will be C minor, fifth of that would be G major, G minor, G major. Let's just say G7. So bar 25, we are modulating back to C minor. So let's just play from 24 onwards. is where things get very interesting in the middle voice. The subject is this sequence here. It's a um, half-step motion, but it's also the fugue, I guess, turned backwards and also upside down, if that makes any amount of sense whatsoever. So let's just hear it from 24 until bar 30, no, yes, bar 30, all right. <laughs> This is, this is the ending of the fugue. This is the very end. Not the very end, but I, you, you understand. So, the concept of hemiola. I don't know what it means off the top of my head, but hemiola is the phenomenon where the time signature in the piece of music doesn't change at all, but the rhythmic pulse behind what you're hearing changes in a way that it sounds like we're off by a beat. So, let's hear it. Beat one. Let me, let me see if I can do that better. So, let's see. That's, of course, counting the subdivisions of 16th notes. The end of bar 31 makes it sound like we are on beat 1, even though we're not. Sorry. It sounds almost as if this introduction of the subject in bar 31 is as we heard it in the original with an eighth note rest and then the subject, but it's it's not. Now, this brief cadence to B flat minor here is a deceptive cadence. And then we have a diminished, it's not a diminished cadence, it's more of a, a C7. beginning of bar 32. And then a passing tone of B flat. And then that was a little incorrect. Hold on. I'll link, I think, a description of Hemiola down below. So, that was the F minor fugue. So now we're going to look at the C sharp minor fugue because the 
the concepts are essentially the same, but we're going to be working with not only a different subject, but also a different, different key. And probably while I'm talking about that, I'm going to remember dozens of things that I should have mentioned in this fugue. And like I said, if my explanations aren't really all that clear, it's probably because I'm not as well versed as I think I am in talking about fugal writing. So here we are with the C sharp minor fugue. And as I just said, the subject is different and how everything is really executed is, is also different. And I think one thing that people forget with fugues is that they can be just as expressive as any other form of writing. It's, it's all the amount of effort that you can put into the writing that makes it expressive. So with that being said, we're going to hear the subject. subject we end on E and I think this is going to be a very good opportunity for me to talk about devising a good counter subject and in most cases with fugal writing you have to well you could have a very consistent counter subject in both of these fugues I, I bend that little expectation and I think that's because three voice writing can be, it, it can be very difficult. I, I, I really won't lie about that. So in this case, we have our answer in G sharp minor. I do is when I come up with a counter subject, I try to see how well it fits from a dexterity point of view in different keys. And if it doesn't, that's that's perfectly fine. Because remember, this is the opening exposition of the fugue. And in this case, just like the F minor fugue, we begin in the soprano in the in the alto. <laughs> in the tenor, and logically the answer would be in the bass. So I'm going to do my best to play and talk at the same time. It might not really be all that great, but sharp. Now we're going to go into a sequence which will lead us back to the tonic key. I know there are no strict rules on how to end the cadence to announce that this is the 
uh, the beginning of, sorry, this is the end of the exposition. So we clearly hear it. <laughs> perfectly to C sharp minor now with sequences most of the time they're going to be in stepwise motion so going oh I didn't measure I didn't number the measures going back to the the G sharp minor sequence uh, <laughs> the end of our exposition. Now, at the end of the exposition, we do have another sequence, and this is going to lead us to the relative major, which is E major. So let's hear it from the end of the, um, what is it, the end of the answer in C sharp minor. <laughs> especially in Baroque writing, is you're going to always have these, uh, I guess, parallels, or I guess you'd call them calling and answering when it comes to, in particular, the two-voice writing. So you can see what I mean in the bottom two, bottom two, bottom two staves of the second page. How we change between one voice having sixteenths and the other one being an eighth and then sixteenths and then eighths up above. So let me see. Here how it's 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 well of course it's a pattern because it's a sequence, but each voice interchanges value. So, and then the lower voice. It's something, it's an element that I just, I, I just find very appealing. I think that's really all there is to it. So at the beginning of page three, we have our statement in E major, and it's in the bass. Sorry. And notice how the counterpoint behind this subject is not what we heard earlier. And frankly, I don't remember why I did it that way. There's our cadence to E major. And after this, we're going to have a sequence where we wind up in a different key. In this case, F sharp minor. You could do, you could somehow get to F sharp major. And what would that be? And then, of course, you'd have. 
have an F sharp 7, which would lead to B major, which could fall to a B7, which could fall to an E. And from there, you could do an E7. Mm, could you? You could. But then you could have F sharp minor. I don't know. The other thing with fugal writing is that even though the form itself is strict, even though that there are certain guidelines that you have to adhere to for something to be a fugue, as opposed to an a canon or an invention or a prelude or whatever, is that it's important to modulate to different keys and do so in a way that's very concise. And But even though you have all those guidelines, there's still so much freedom that you can have with this kind of form that you don't really find in anything else. So let's just hear from the sequence from E major to F sharp minor. <laughs> sequence and you're going to hear that once again whereas before after the before the E major entrance we had that uh, parallel of two voices with opposite note values so eighths and sixteenths but in this case there's now a third voice and it descends into the bass so let's just hear from F sharp minor. Sorry. favorite keys, at least on the piano, because we have all these these dark and melancholy chromatic moments here, which... Especially this, this clash between... to be worried about voice leading now. So you can't have too much parallel motion. In this case, if they both, the E and the B and the bass, you could go down to A for both voices. But that just sounds, it sounds clunky and boring. So, oh no, wait, that's exactly what I did. All right, I get an F for the day. So. The Now, except, of course, if you look at the score, that is what both voices do. All three voices do descend downwards. Sorry. They all descend downwards, which does 
sound boring. However, you can get around that guideline by, uh, of course, delaying the subject again. So, hmm. But then, of course, what I could do is have both the bass and the tenor collide on the same note in unison. But it sounds so empty, especially seeing as now everything is moving into the treble clef. So, again, another tritone. And then the bass and the tenor both descend to A. And the soprano, soprano? Soprano, it is the soprano. Now we have the subject again. It's a very unique and light moment, isn't it? Because in the E major entrance, the only other entrance where this subject is not in any kind of minor key, we have C sharp minor, G sharp minor, C sharp minor, F sharp minor, and also C sharp minor. That's five, yes, five different um, tonic keys for the subject. But then, there are only two moments where it's in any kind of major key. So, it's, it, it fits with the mood of the fugue. And that's probably something else that I should talk about, is with fugues, because you can express anything that you can express in any other different kind of piece of music, why should it not be allowed that with fugal writing, you... It's, it's strictly absolute. It's subject and nothing else. I, I find that's, that's a very boring way of thinking. But with fugues, you can, you can also express anything else. And I think the good thing about fugal writing is that if the subject is the same throughout, then that must mean that the mood can be, I guess, changed throughout. But it's, it, it can still be consistent. C-sharp minor is a, is, a, is a very dark key. And everything, everything around it can be likewise just as dark. Even moving to, what would it be, F-sharp? Everything about C sharp minor is just very, very, very dark and gloomy. But then we have these instances of, you know, E major. We have an E7, so we're falling to A. So when you're character, when you're deciding what to write with fuel writing, what kind of mood would you want to get across to the listener? I mean, this this fugue is definitely very. I guess you'd say solemn, but then there are moments where they, the solemn is, is lifted. It's like the clouds are lifted after a rainstorm and the sun comes out, but then you look at the forecast and it's still going to keep raining. So that's, that's definitely what still happens in this fugue. So let's go from A major until we modulate back to C sharp minor. This entire bar before the entrance in the bass is all just quickly wrapping things up to get back to C sharp minor. So you would expect C sharp minor, there we go, but instead 
you can deceive everybody by introducing the fourth, in this case, F sharp minor, and hear how I do that. You would expect the bass to fall to C, but instead, introducing the A in the bass, we're thinking, oh, is that a six, maybe? An A major chord, but no, because the bass moves tail end of beat one is the subject. But all the while, this first half of beat one is a four chord. That was not really well. Let's just hear the measure before. writing, but of course, in my own fashion, the counterpoint just isn't consistent. And especially the final bar is, is where more harmonies are, are delayed. Let's just hear it from beat one, two, three, beat three onwards. <laughs> syncopation is a way of getting around writing strictly, say, uh, let's see, instead it's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. And in terms of performing, you have to it's, it, it's very, not necessarily vague, but keeps the audience on their, t well, the listener on their toes, because you don't know if I'm going to move up to E sharp or E natural. And if we look at both the outer and the, sorry, the two outer voices, the top voice and the lower voice, we're descending... <laughs> One goes up, the other goes down. But if both the if the inner voice and the upper voice descend at uh, sorry ascend at the same time, it's again it's just a little bit boring in a way. It's almost like delaying the ending of a sad story. The other difficult thing with fugal writing is coming up with a decent ending. And it's kind of the same way with making these videos for you. I simply have no idea how to close everything out. So I suppose that's it, and thank you for watching, and I hope that I can make another video like this in the future.